How am I supposed to do the whole video like that? I can't even hold the microphone. Let's try something else. That's better. Can you tell who I am? Anyway, you guys all know the drill by now. Beating every Super Nintendo game, live streaming it all, making videos about it, that kind of thing. Can you guess what game we're playing today? I'll give you a quick hint. It involves this pink puffball, that angry artist, and the cutest damn animal companions you've ever seen. Move over, Pikachu. I'd rather chill with Nago. That's right, we're playing Mild's Dreamland 3. Oh wait, no, excuse me, uh, Kirby. Kirby's Dreamland 3. Oh man, it's so hard to tell those two apart. Developed by HAL Laboratory Inc, who brought you such games as... But really, the only game that matters is... Kirby's Dreamland 3 was published by Nintendo on November 27th, 1997 in the US and March 27th, 1998 in Japan. Sadly, we over here in the power regions wouldn't get to play this game until 2009 when it was released on the Wii Virtual Console. What the hell? Are we not good enough for Kirby? Interestingly, this was the final first party game to be released on the Super Nintendo in the US. To find out what the last third party release was though, you'll have to subscribe to the channel and wait to see my video on it. The game didn't sell so great. According to the Game Data Library, Kirby's Dreamland 3 only sold just over 76,000 copies in Japan. I've been unable to find the US numbers though. This is likely due to the fact that it was released so late in the console's lifetime being released after the Nintendo 64. The game was directed by Shinichi Shimomura, who was known for directing Kirby's Dreamland 2, 3, Kirby the Crystal Shards, and Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland. As far as I can see, since Nightmare in Dreamland way back in 2002, he hasn't worked on any new games. The game's music was composed by Jun Ishikawa, which is not surprising if you know much about the Kirby series. Jun has composed almost every single Kirby game. Just look at all of these. The critical reception for the game was mixed at best. The majority of the reviews gave praise to the charming hand-drawn art style while criticising the lack of difficulty. Another reason people weren't too hyped on Dreamland 3 was that just a year earlier Kirby Superstar came out. This had much more going for it, both in terms of difficulty and overall content. The story of Kirby's Dreamland 3 is introduced to us via some very cute comic book style panels. This is a very rough overview of what happens though, it really does leave it up to your imagination. If we take a look in the manual though, we can see a bit more of a detailed story. We see that Kirby and old mate Gooey over here are hanging out on Planet Popstar having a bit of a chill day fishing. Out of nowhere, a big black cloud envelops the sky before it splits into smaller clouds and scatters it across the land. The clouds start to take control of King DDD and his minions, forcing them to do dastardly deeds. Coco the... Pigeon, I think? He rocks up and he's like, Oi, Kerbs, Popstar's in a bit of a pickle right now. We gotta go deal with this. And off they set on yet another journey to save Popstar. Alright, so now we've got controller Kirby, what can we do? For those few who don't know, most Kirby games are traditional platformers. You run from left to right to get to the end of the level, rinse and repeat. In this particular iteration, we've got a total of 30 levels to play through, spanning across 5 worlds. 6 if you count Hyperzone, but we'll touch on that a bit later. Kirby has a few abilities though, he can run and jump just like you'd expect, but he can also float by continuously tapping the jump button. Kirby's main gimmick though is his suck and swallow ability. <laughs> oh, oh, no, 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 no. Let's not call it that, hey. Uh, how about we call it his inhale ability? Let's go with that instead. Kirby can inhale enemies or certain blocks and spit them back out to do damage. More importantly though, with certain enemies he can swallow them to gain a unique ability, depending on the type of enemy. There are nine copy abilities in Kirby's Dreamland 3. Burning, Cleaning, Cutter, Ice, Needle, Parasol, Spark, Stone, and Love Love Stick? Depending on the ability, Kirby can perform different special moves using the Y button. With the burning ability, Kirby shoots forward while engulfed in flames. The distance you move gets shorter with each consecutive use until you take a break. Cleaning allows Kirby to sweep in front of himself with a broom, which is just so cute. I love it. Cutter lets you throw a boomerang that will come back to you after a certain distance. With the ice ability, Kirby breathes out cold, icy breath while you hold down the Y button. This freezes enemies, turning them into blocks of ice. Needle lets you surround yourself in dangerous spines. They damage enemies for as long as the button's held down. While holding the parasol, 
Kirby can keep it in front of himself and damage enemies that walk into it, kind of like a shield that does damage. Spark gives Kirby a small electrical barrier around himself which damages anything that touches it. Stone is very similar to in Smash Bros. It turns Kirby into an invincible stone and if it's used in the air, it can slam down on top of enemies, destroying them. And of course, how could we forget about the Love Love Stick? This lets Kirby shoot heart stars in front of him. This, however, is only used in the final boss fight, but stick around to hear more about that very strange encounter later. The copy abilities are really what make Kirby games such a joy to play. Having so many different options to choose from with your offense makes for unique gameplay situations and it allows you a little bit more replayability. That isn't all though. Each of these copy abilities also has a unique synergy with each animal buddy. Come to think of it, we haven't even spoken about the animal buddies yet. In Kirby's Dream Land 3, you can have one of six animal companions to come along with you on your journey. Each of them has their own unique abilities as well as their different synergies with copied abilities. First off, we have Rick the Hamster. He's best suited for land. Rick can perform wall jumps to get to new heights as well as having the ability to charge enemies with an open mouth and eat them. Now I won't go over every single synergy with every animal buddy and every copy ability or we're going to be here all bloody day. So I'll just be mentioning the animal's unique abilities alone. To find out about all the different synergies you're just going to have to play the game for yourself. I do recommend it though. Our second animal buddy is Koo the Owl. Unlike Rick, Koo doesn't have any special offensive abilities but he can fly with ease. All you need to do is tap up and down on the controller and he's the only animal buddy who can fly without being hindered in the strong wind sections of the game. Next up we have Kine the Sunfish. Kine? Keen? Kine? Kinney? I don't know how you meant to say that one. I'm gonna go with Kine. Kine obviously thrives in water. He's able to swim through harsh currents with ease, allowing you to collect items that would otherwise be inaccessible. Somehow though, Kine can also move pretty easily on land. He's a bit slower than the other animals, but considering he's a fish, that's not bad. My personal favourite animal buddy is up next, Nago the Cat. For some reason, Nago rolls Kirby around like a little ball and I just love it. I love it so much. Nago can also do triple jumps and all of Nago's copy abilities use Kirby as some sort of a weapon, which is so funny. We also have Pitch the Bird. No particular type of bird apparently, just bird. Pitch flies with Kirby as well, but he seems to struggle a bit more than Koo. He's not quite as strong, the poor little fella. Last but certainly not least, we have Choo Choo the Octopus, apparently. Uh, are you sure about that? Uh, it doesn't look like an octopus to me, but uh, whatever. Choo Choo the Octopus. Choo Choo has the unique ability that allows Kirby to swallow enemies while underwater, as well as being able to walk on ceilings. Also, I just love that when you're playing as Choo Choo and if you suck up an enemy, rather than Kirby doing the inhaling, Choo Choo just reaches out one of her long tentacles and nabs them. It looks so funny. Interestingly, there is one friend of Kirby whose appearance can allow the game to be played in two-player mode. While playing a level, if you push the A button, you can sacrifice one block of your health to bring out Gooey. He can be controlled by player two or left up to the computer to control. Gooey plays somewhat similarly to Kirby, being able to devour enemies with his long tongue, somewhat like a Yoshi. But Gooey can only eat one enemy at a time, unlike Kirby. He can even gain copy abilities just like Kirby. If you're in a bit of a pinch and you're about to die, you can also suck Gooey up and eat him again to regain one point of health. Poor Gooey. I didn't utilize this awesome feature anywhere near enough in my playthrough. I just kept forgetting about him. I also didn't really know what he did. Anyway, I think I've gone on far too long. Let's hop into the gameplay. We started out in Grassland and immediately I was confused. What the f What was that? I have no idea what's going on. I just know you can eat people. I very quickly discovered the joy of animal companions while still being a little bit confused. Look at that cat, it's adorable. And that hamster? What is that? Can you come back? Are you a friend? I don't know what the hell that thing is. For some reason, I didn't even try to do anything with our little buddies here. I just left them alone. So my first criticism of the game came up very quickly. In this game, to run, you need to double tap forward rather than just having a dedicated run button. This never got any less annoying to me. I really didn't like that. I found it to be annoying throughout my entire playthrough. Not enough to ruin the game or anything, but it was just a bit of a nitpick. At the end of the level, we ran over to some flowers. I really smushed them down into the ground. It felt good, like real good. But then I came across a sad flower. I didn't think anything of it at the time. Turns out there are missions in each level of Kirby's Dream Land 3. And the mission for this level was simply, don't smush the damn flowers. But how was I supposed to know? They just look so smushable. If you complete a level mission, you're awarded with a heart star. These will come up again later, so just remember that. After completing the level, I got my first attempt at a bonus game. Kirby swings his arms back and forth. You need to time your jump just right and land on the item you want to receive. 
Of course, I screwed this up and I got nothing. Level 2 starts out with a bunch of different enemies you can absorb to test out the different power-ups. I like this, it's a good way to show early on in the game what Kirby's capable of. I came across more animal friends, but still was not smart enough to figure out how to get them to join me. Soon after I had a realisation, this game is kinda confusing if you don't read the manual. What are all these things? <laughs> Nothing is intuitive, I don't know what's going on. Turns out that was the second level's mission area. I didn't have a clue though, hell I didn't even know that there were missions in this game. Level 3 started out with more animal friends that I just left alone, sadly. My second big complaint of the game came up during level 3. Yeah, I knew Kirby games were meant to be easy, but this is kind of... not much of anything. This game is just too damn easy, like to the point where it's kind of boring at times. It's not a bad game by any means, but it's just not much of a challenge most of the time. Level 3's mission was the first of its kind. There was a little fella throwing these different stone enemies. You had to see it and pick it from a lineup afterwards. If you're too slow or you weren't paying attention, you fail. Much like I did. These are a little bit tricky if you're not expecting them. They start as soon as you enter the room, so you really need to be on your toes, paying attention whenever you enter a new room. Finally, I learnt how to get an animal friend to join. It only took me four levels to figure it out. Our first companion for the journey was Choo Choo the Octopus. At the start of level 5, I discovered my favourite power-up combination, and the thing that kinda ruined the game for me a little bit. Being able to literally just fly through levels above all the enemies is kinda broken if you ask me. It takes away a lot of the challenge of these levels. Obviously, I decided to abuse this power-up though by flying through levels 5 and 6. It took a bit of damage because I suck at flying, but Kirby just has so much health it didn't really seem to matter, and quickly I was heading into the boss stage of World 1. Wispy Woods. Wispy is a giant tree who angrily throws fruit, or puffs of air at Kirby. It can catch the fruit and throw it back at Wispy. It took me a minute to figure out what to do though. I was throwing fruit at him and it wasn't doing any damage. That was until I accidentally threw something at his face and then he finally took some damage. After a couple more hits, I was thinking this sure is easy, but then this absolute nightmare fuel decided to show up and scare the hell out of me. The rest of the boss fight was still super easy though. We did our little dance and we flew off to World 2. Ripple Field. It wasn't until level 2 of World 2 that I finally managed to complete one of the level missions, although I didn't exactly realise what I'd done or why. And in level 3 I realised you could equip other animal companions, I didn't have to play the entire game just hanging out with Choo Choo. So we proceeded with the aid of Kine the Sunfish. Having Kine made the water section somewhat bearable finally, as your swimming speed without him is really disgustingly slow. During level 4 of World 2, I had my first death of the game. I was getting way too cocky, thinking the game was just so easy, and I let my health get really low from just dumb mistakes, and eventually it caught up to me. During this level, I also came to the realisation that you can fly forever regardless of your power-ups. I just hadn't tried it previously. Again, kinda broken just being able to fly over everything. I started out the next level gaining the friendship of the greatest animal companion ever. Oh shit! <laughs> Oh, that's a game changer. Hell yeah. <laughs> oh, that's sick. Before long, it was time to face off against the boss of World 2, Acro the Orca Whale. The fight starts out pretty easy with him rushing towards you, but if you manage to jump over him, he hits his head and all these rocks fall down. You can throw them at him then to cause damage. After a few hits, we fell down to the water below. This is where the auto-scroller segment started. I very quickly died during this section though as I'd started the fight with very low health. In the auto-scroller section you dodge the skulls, anchors and uh, tiny whales that he spits at you until you reach the end. This is where he rams himself face first into the wall for some reason causing rocks to fall down from above. You can grab one of these rocks and throw it at him to deal a lot of damage. Unfortunately, I died a second time while trying to figure out what I was meant to do. But as they say, third time's a charm. Turns out, all the other projectiles that he throws your way you can also throw back at him, so I defeated him by throwing a tiny whale at him. Off to World 3, Sand Canyon. Level 1 didn't give me much to talk about really, but still I just wanted to bring this up quickly. Look at these damn cavemen, they're so cute, I love them. Level 2 has this classic song, need I say more? I noticed a big issue with my playstyle while playing through level 2. 
If you fly through all the levels avoiding everything, you have no chance to pick anything up. That includes health power-ups, extra lives, or anything else that you might come across. This means, even if you're getting hit only a few times each level, you're never finding anything to heal yourself back up, so you're going to die eventually. Also seems a bit broken that I can just do that. This statement really sums up my feelings on the game up to this point. There's nothing inherently wrong with Kirby's Dream Land 3, there's just nothing that would really keep me playing it if I didn't need to do it for this video. The last level in World 3 has a very cool mission, I just wanted to quickly touch on this. For whatever reason, you need to travel through this trippy as heck pyramid. There's challenges you gotta do along the way to collect pieces of Rob the Robot to put him back together. I don't really know why. It doesn't make much sense in the context of anything to do with this game, but I don't care. I love it. Look at these backgrounds, they're just so pretty. After spending way too long struggling, trying to get all the pieces of Rob, I discovered you don't actually need to, it's only for the mission to get the Star Heart, not to finish the level. So I bailed and I just finished off the level. On to the boss fight. Pon and Con. They are so cute. Pon is a little raccoon and Con is a fox. Well, that's usually what people would say, but I think technically they're actually a Tanuki and a Kitsune. <laughs> I don't know if I pronounced that right, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Kitsune? Kitsune? Kitsun? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure how you meant to pronounce that. In this boss fight, they both run at you from either side of the screen while being followed by tiny versions of themselves. Meanwhile, there are these bombs dropping from above that you can also get damaged by. The aim is to suck up the miniatures and spit them back at Pon and Con to cause damage. It's a pretty easy boss fight, but it's just challenging enough to still be fun. Off to World 4, Cloudy Park. This is my favourite world, as far as the visuals go anyway. Spending your time running through the clouds, having these puffs of clouds fly past the camera, playing in the rain clouds, you know, it's all just very visually appealing. The first thing of note to happen in this world was in level 3. Halfway through the level we encountered a mid-boss by the name of Jumper Shoot. It might just sound like he's named this because he jumps and shoots, but actually it's a portmanteau of the words Jump and Bumper Shoot, which is apparently another word for umbrella. I've never heard that word before today. I absolutely love Jumper Shoot's design. He's based off the Japanese yokai, Kasa Obake. They're usually depicted as umbrellas with one leg that they hop around on, one big eye, a long tongue, and they wear a Japanese sandal known as a geta. I've always really loved the design of Kasa Abake. There's just something very unusual about them that appeals to me. You've probably seen them depicted in quite a few Japanese video games if you really think about it, even if you haven't noticed. Jumper Shoot was pretty easy to beat though I took him out in only a few seconds. Nothing much of note happened again until we made it to the boss of this world. We've met this little fella before. This is Ardo. Or is that Adeline? Well, honestly, people aren't too sure. It's generally assumed that Ardo and Adeline are actually the same character and the name just changed between Kirby's Dream Land 3 and Kirby the Crystal Shards, but that's actually never been confirmed. This boss fight is genuinely really hard. Maybe the hardest part of the whole game. At least that's how it felt for me. The Ardo fight starts out with her painting a picture of a little blue dragon. He comes to life and he attacks you, either by flying directly at you or shooting ice cubes at you. You can suck up these ice cubes and shoot them back at him to do some damage. Once you take out the dragon, you face off against an anglerfish who either shoots little balls of light at you, which you can't suck up, or he shoots stars at you, which you can, and then you can throw back at him. After the fish is when things start to get really hard though. You have to fight against this sun and moon at the same time. One will fly along the ground trying to ram you while the other flies above you shooting stuff down at you. If you manage to catch one of the projectiles from whichever one's on top, you can shoot it back at either of them to do some damage. The hard part about this is trying to get the top guy to shoot at you while you're far enough away from the bottom guy that you can actually grab the projectile without getting hurt. It's a bit tricky to explain, so just check out the footage, you'll see what I mean. If you take one out though, it changes the attack pattern to move diagonally up and down while shooting at you. It also moves faster now. If by some miracle you manage to survive the sun and moon fight, then you have to fight this weird cyclops cloud. He shoots lightning bolts at you, and then occasionally he'll release miniature versions of himself that you can suck up and fire at him. Every time you die, you have to start the whole thing over, and this happened to me many, many times. After streaming Kirby's Dream Land for 2 hours and 34 minutes, I was getting a bit tired. I was kind of sick of dying to this same boss fight, so I decided to call it there for a day. The next day I was itching to get back to stream to finish off the game though. I think the fatigue was just starting to get to me on day one, because this time I managed to defeat up to and including the cloud on my first attempt. After the cloud, Ardo gets upset and jumps down to attack you herself. She runs back and forth, flailing her paintbrush wildly with her eyes tightly shut. I was worried this would be difficult, and I did not want to have to do the entire fight again. Lucky for me, all you need to do is stand still. 
Yeah, seriously, you just stand there, she'll run into you, and then she stumbles over and that's the end of the boss fight. Now obviously I found this really frustrating and quite difficult, but I've got to give the designers props for this boss fight. It was really well designed and it was fun, just hard. Time for the final world, Iceberg. Level 2 of this world has an auto-scroller segment where you need to run from an avalanche, but my god did they make it a tight squeeze. By the end of that section, there's barely any room between yourself and the end of the screen. It really makes it hard to avoid the oncoming enemies. Also, look at this guy. This is so creepy for a Kirby game. My god. This level also has a great little easter egg. Some of the rooms you enter have little metroids floating around in them and they'll jump on your head if you get too close. This doesn't do any damage though. The mission for this level was actually to freeze them, but I didn't realise that so I just whacked them into the lava waterfall. Uh, lava fall? Uh, I don't know. I guess there's no water so it's a uh, lava fall. When you reach the end of the level, Samus is there waiting for you. She doesn't move at all though, it's a little bit creepy. <laughs> Level 4 is very odd. I think you meant to be in an airship or something making your way through it. So you just go through room after room after room. There's little challenges in each room. Some are easy, some are just an enemy or two to take out. Others are a bit more tricky. Then there's something like this nightmare room. Bam. <laughs> Bam. Nothing's fucking creepy. Level 5 is similar again, climbing up the airship, but this time you run into a bunch of mini bosses as you progress. Starting out with this rock fella who died in one hit. Next up was another jumper shoot fight. Same as the last time, not too hard, just suck up his sandal and spit it back at him. After that was a cute little snow blob, he splits into smaller pieces and you just suck them up and spit them back at him, nice and easy. Next mini boss was so damn cute, just look at him. Then there was this cute little fireball, nice and easy, just dodge and shoot. And then finally, the last mini boss with this spiky bomb guy. Also, very easy. With that, we're finally up to King DDD. This boss fight is really fun, you have to dodge his hammer swings and ground pounds. When he hits the ground, little stars pop out that you can shoot back at him. After you take out his first form, things start to get a little bit weird though. He floats up into the air, but he kind of looks a bit unconscious. Then his stomach opens up to reveal this big black eyeball. In this form he'll shoot black goo at you and if you get too close to his stomach it turns into a mouthful of razor sharp teeth and he'll try to eat you. Honestly it's kind of shocking for a Kirby game, everything's been super cute up to this point. I died against him on his second phase unfortunately. It was my last life too. I got my first game over of the playthrough right at the end of it. Luckily this is a Kirby game so it's pretty forgiving. I loaded the game back up and I was still up to the DDD fight with two lives. This time I was more careful, I took my time with the fight, dodging, only attacking when I saw an opening and before long I had done it. I had defeated King DDD. Woo! Did we do it? Did we do it? Eat his ass. No, that's inappropriate. I think we might have done it. Roll credits. The credits play through with Kirby and Gooey walking home while the names of all the enemies are shown on the bottom of the screen. Right at the end we get shown this big black blob from the start of the game with a question mark, a very ominous ending to the game. Now if you know anything about the game, you're probably shouting at your screen right now and shouting at me. Yes, it turns out there are two endings to this game and as you probably guessed, I got the bad ending. So you might remember at the start of the video I mentioned that there were five worlds but like kind of six worlds. There is, there's six worlds but world six is only one level and it's a boss fight. To get to world 6 though you need to complete the mission in every single level, you need to collect all the heart stars in the game. I had no idea about this while I was playing through the game so I didn't even attempt it. It wasn't until I started writing the script that I found out about this and saw the footage of the true final boss fight. Safe to say that I'm a little bit disappointed I didn't get to experience it for myself. Who knows, maybe later on down the line I'll go back to this game just to try and get the good ending during a stream. Let me know in the comments if you guys want to see that. So I got the bad ending where Dark Matter isn't defeated. But what happens in the good ending? We still need to talk about it even if I didn't get to experience it first hand. So in the good ending, once Kirby enters the final level, Hyperzone, all his heart stars combine to make the love love stick. And then the true final boss fight begins. You first have to take out Dark Matter by shooting at him with the love love stick. Once he's defeated, Zero appears, a gigantic eyeball who starts out shooting these tiny Dark Matters at you. Once you damage him enough though, things start to get a little bit dark, a little bit weird. He starts shooting balls of blood at you. Like, seriously, blood in a Kirby game? It's a bit odd. Once you damage him even more, his red pupil explodes out from inside of him in a pretty grotesque way. Just look at this shit, how the hell was this allowed in a Kirby game? I love it! Once you shoot his pupil a few more times, that's the end of the boss fight. Dark Matter and Zero are defeated. 
Roll the good credits. You get shown these cute scribbly drawings of all the bosses and all the animal friends with their names written there while cheerful upbeat music plays. I love it, it's really cute. I wish I'd gotten to experience it for myself. Lesson learnt. I need to do a bit of research on the games before I start playing so I don't miss out on the good bits like I did this time. So Kirby's Dream Land 3 is a decent game. There's nothing inherently wrong with it, like I've said before. It just didn't do much for me. Yeah, it's not going to be the same for everybody though. You guys might love it. It's a chill platformer. You can get through it in an afternoon. So, you know, in some ways it's got its place. If that's what you're after, a nice, quick, easy game. Definitely. Just didn't work for me. For the gameplay, I'll rate this game a 6 out of 10. The controls feel a little bit off to me, like I mentioned earlier. Having a double tap to run doesn't feel good in a platformer. I often felt like my attacks would miss when they should have hit. You need to get really, really close to the enemies for some of the attacks. Like the electric shock. It often leads you to just walk into the enemies before you get a chance to hit the attack button, and it doesn't feel good. The difficulty of this game just feels a little bit low for my liking, for the most part anyway. I know it's a Kirby game and they're meant to be easy, accessible games for everyone, but it just felt kind of dull leaving more to be desired. Being able to ride along with the animal companions definitely ups the score a bit for me though. That's one of my favourite aspects of the game, not to mention the fact they all have unique synergies with different copy abilities. That's truly the heart of this game though, and most Kirby games. Having fun with all the different abilities, I certainly did enjoy that part of the game. So I would like to play this game again in future just to get the good ending, mainly to see if it changes my opinion on the game. Maybe it'll feel a bit more balanced in difficulty if I'm not just racing through every level trying to get to the end as fast as possible. For the music, I'll give Kirby's Dream Land 3 a 6.5 out of 10. The music's fun, it's very upbeat and very cheerful. It's well suited to this kind of game. I don't think it has as many classic songs as some of the other games on the Super Nintendo. Not many songs really stuck with me after I finished playing it, except for of course Sand Canyon 2, a certified banger of a tune. Obviously having played hundreds upon hundreds of hours of Smash 64 as a kid, that tune is totally ingrained in my brain permanently. There is no denying though that that is a great song regardless of where you first heard it or how many times you've heard it before. The graphics are the best part of the game for me, they're a 7.5 out of 10. The visual style of this game is cute, it's sort of sketchy hand drawn aesthetic is perfect for a Kirby game. That's one thing Kirby games always have going for them. The art style is always unique and really cute. It feels purposeful, like they didn't just go for whatever was easiest to make or what everyone was doing. They had a unique art style for their games and I really like that. I didn't really even get to touch on the character design in the rest of the video, but it's amazing. The enemies are all unique and well designed. There are so many cute memorable characters, like look at this little guy, he's just rolling his boat. It's so cute. The animal companions of course have great designs too. They're all unique and memorable. They feel like companions you want to have joining you on a mission. Not just some companions you have to bring along. And of course the darker elements popping up towards the end are just cool as heck. I love the possessed DDD monster with his stomach jaws. How cool is that? Overall, the game gets a 7 out of 10 in my books. It's a decently fun time, it doesn't overstay its welcome, and it does what it sets out to do. It's just not really a game I see myself going back to very often. Thank you all so much for watching right through to the end of the video. And thank you so much for your patience while I've been making this video. It's fairly new to me still. I'm learning a lot about the process and how to make it more efficient. So hopefully they'll get faster in the future. I've started up streaming again, but now here on YouTube. Keep an eye on your sub page and see if you can catch a stream. It'd be really fun to have some more people in the streams. A few people who have come along have been really great to hang out with. I try my best to post in the community tab beforehand to give you guys a bit of a heads up for when I'll be live. But sometimes I don't know until half an hour before. So just keep an eye out. If you miss any streams and you want to catch up on them later, I do have them all organized in a playlist on my channel. They're pretty easy to find, but I will leave a link in the description to make it even easier. If you have any friends who you think would enjoy my videos, maybe send them a link. It'd really help out a ton, just like if you were to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Wink wink. Anyway, that's enough plugging my own channel. Alright, so now the only reason you guys have stuck around this long after the main video is finished to find out what we're playing next. Well, as is today's theme, not doing my research properly, I thought the next video was going to be Warriors Woods, but as I started writing the script, I found out I haven't really beaten the game. I'd only beaten half of the game. There's a whole other section I hadn't even done yet, so I'm going to have to go back to that on stream later. So instead, our next video is going to be Mortal Kombat. That's pretty exciting if you ask me. I do love Mortal Kombat. Stick around and hopefully it won't be such a long wait for the next video. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next episode. Have a wonderful day.